I'm on a farm in southwest Wisconsin with a buddy of mine named Carl Malcolm. He and I are going out to a small cattail slough to set some underwater traps for muskrat and beaver. One of the best things that can happen to you in trapping is like good channels, travel ways. You see all these bubbles? Just beavers and muskrats exhaling. If stuff's coming from this open water, enter in here to go back in the slough, and we got a wide gap here. You could fence this with put a bunch of sticks in the mud and try to neck it down, but it's kind of a natural pinch point right there. So we should check that out. A lot less fencing to do. What's your guess on depth? Check that spud. Oh, might be in business. Anything that's cruising through here, if we fence this, we have a shot at it. We gotta set this, man. I fur trapped all through growing up, from when I was 10 till I was 22 years old. I just knew I was gonna make my living trapping for the rest of my life. When I did quit, it was because fur prices had dropped so low that you couldn't even recover your expenses, let alone turn a profit. But even though I quit trapping for the commercial markets, I still like to get out now and then. For one thing, beaver and muskrat are actually quite tasty. And to top it all off, beaver and muskrat pelts are gorgeous. Even the throw pillows on my couch are made of beaver fur. That ice floating around is a trigger magnet. What's more, furs are at their most prime in the midwinter when there's not a lot of other hunting opportunities that are open. This right here is like kind of a classic channel set where you got open water, creek, which is the main thoroughfare, probably of a lot of beaver and muskrat traffic. But then there's this slough or backwater off here and there's muskrat huts in there. We just blocked off a bunch, set two body gripper, 330 of bears in here. It's a great trap for beaver. It's a little big for muskrat. I think a lot of muskrats pass through without getting stung, but we'll see. If there's anybody going from this slough out into the creek, this is how they're doing it right here. But I'm gonna put a dab of caster up here just so maybe a beaver traveling up and down that creek might get a whiff and realize that someone's moved in on his business and he's gonna wanna come in here and, and, and beat him up. Are you with me in saying that caster's probably the best smell in the world? I love the smell of caster, man. You can see why I used to put it in perfume. Yeah. It must be so laden with pheromones though because it, it's one of those smells that just hits you like at a very primal part of your brain where you smell it and you're like, I don't know what it is about and, that. And I've read a lot that they know. Obviously, they're intimate with all the caster smells from their colony. Yeah. And they know an invading beaver's caster. And they probably smell. have their favorite lady friend smell too. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's going to drive them nuts, man. <laughs> <laughs> that beaver's going to be like, oh, man, there's someone up in that slough now. Man, with that breeze blowing just like that, he's going to be. Carl and I move on to our next spot, and it's full of sign. This is home sweet home right here, Steve. This is gonna be a solid spot here, man. It's right up under here. This guy brings a lot of corn home, man. This is gonna be a fat beaver. <laughs> this is a classic Riverside Beaver Lodge, where the lodge has been built up on the bank of the river. The beavers maintain an entrance tunnel that comes in below the water surface and then climbs up into the cavity inside the lodge. The closest you can get to a surefire beaver set is to block the entrance with a body gripping trap, then stabilize the trap with sticks driven through the springs and into the mud and anchor the trap with wire to a stout limb. If I was gonna say something to catch a beaver, I'd say that's gonna do it. I'm with you, man. Let's get out of here and get to the next set. With our beaver trap set, it's time to switch gears and hit up a muskrat area. I think this, this might be the spot right here. Ooh, dude, we might have hit it. There's kind of like three real prominent features to a muskrat area. Primary thing would be the den of the lodge called a muskrat hut. A hut like that might support five muskrats. Another thing that you'll find, they'll do an equivalent thing on something we call a push-up where they'll just build a small mound of vegetation like this and they'll actually eat the center of it out and they'll enter under the ice and just have a little spot up in there where he's got open water and he'll pop up and just feed in there. He doesn't live in there, but he just uses that as a resting place away from his lodge to feed. Obviously not as big as a lodge, not as domed, not as like neat and tidy, 
but still they'll, they'll use them. The tricky part on push-ups is finding the entrance. One of the things that's really impressive too is no matter how cold it gets, they're actually entering up an opening that's maintained and that all that vegetation helps insulate that open water in there so they can get in and out. This will be buried under the snow sometimes, three or four feet thick, but they've still got that open water access. And sometimes you'll see that all the push-ups got a hole dug in them from mink or fox come through this, dig in, check for muskrat, dig in, check for muskrat. Everything from raptors, foxes, coyotes. Yeah, everybody wants them. Everybody wants them. So as evening comes down, we set a few more traps at some muskrat push-ups, and we also set some body gripping traps and tunnels where muskrats are accessing dens that have been excavated into the banks of the slough. My prediction, one beaver, one muskrat. One beaver, one muskrat? We well, yeah, put that many sets out. I don't know if that's optimistic or pessimistic, but it's, it's we'll go the middle. With it. What's the middle between optimism and pessimism? Renellaism. Renellaism would be a little something for the first stretcher in the stew pot. I'd be happy with that. We've had these traps soaking for like 16 hours, which is not that long, but it was 16 good hours in that they had the evening, latter part of the evening, all night, and then the morning to try to go about their business. So, should be something happening. This doesn't look disturbed. I do see some air bubbles. Doesn't look like that trap's fired though, does it? Nope. How it goes. Yeah, I didn't like the set because there's no evidence of, there's no beaver lodges back there. There's no evidence where they're busting up through the ice back there. And I think muskrats would come and go all day through 3.30s and maybe not spring them. Maybe we had some come through here with the bubbles, you know, it's possible. Trapping is like a exercise in learning how to manage disappointment. Come on. That spring looks like it could no, be spread. No? Not even sprung. Oh, man. We'd have never made it in the old days. Dude, we'd be cold and hungry and poor. Oh, man. There's a beaver. Hey, 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 man. Looks like we got him exiting. He was just hiding up in there, sweating it the whole time we were here. That's the America was built on right there, man, beaver pelts. Not just America, this whole continent. Oh, that's a good sized beaver. That's a dandy. You wanna grab a side of that and hoist him up? You know, the thing I dig most about beavers and beaver trapping is that it's like this was the economic engine that drove the settlement of this continent. First people go up the Hudson River there trying to trap beaver and find beaver pelts. Go up the St. Lawrence trying to trap beaver and find beaver pelts. All the Great Lakes. The guys that found all the passes through the Rockies were Rocky Mountain beaver trappers. It led to all kinds of horrible exploitation and, you know, extirpation of wildlife. And we almost lost these things at a time, you know. Got too hammered, but. So it's kind of this emblem of Wilderness found, then lost, then found again, you know? I like that. But everything about it, I mean, what a, what a cool animal. That fur is something else. That tail, man. A lot of times you'll see their tail getting kind of chewed up when they're scrapping with other beavers, but this is a pretty flawless looking tail on this That's guy. That's a low blow shot, man, to bite another beaver's tail, man. He's probably, what, 40 pounds, 35 pounds? Man. He's corn fed. <laughs> He's got that extra corn weight. Fire. Oh, oh rat stick. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Marsh Rabbit. Had a good feeling about that, Dan. Did you? It's almost like not fair to a muskrat to have the word rat in there. Look at that. You get rid of that tail, you like ignore that tail and look at that fur with those guard hairs and that just like really beautiful under fur. And these things are just prolific breeders too, you know, from a biological standpoint. They'll, they'll have multiple litters, lots of kits per litter. They have extremely high mortality. Um, naturally, natural mortality, and they're designed biologically to cope with that. They do really well being trapped. It's, a, it's an awesome, sustainable, renewable resource. 
and they're not bad table fare either. Uh-oh, we've exceeded my expectations. Mr. Scratch, they're coming in to the dam. I like that set. And that undercoat's so thick that there's not a drop of water hitting their skin. To be able to stay warm under the ice and everything is quite a feat. Yeah, to come out of the water looking like that. It's a cool critter. This makes me want to snuggle him. So I think that first one came out of one of your sets. This was a set I put out and kind of tag team that beaver. Even Steven. And I appreciate you coming out, bringing, bringing your equipment out. Hey, you bet. I look forward to doing it again. It's a cool place to be this time of year. Thank you.